one year ago, something very special happened at Fivefold Church in the park. We were in Pan Pacific Park, not this park. We were in Pan Pacific Park when it happened. But this is what happened. The backstory is that for those of you that don't know my story, I was pursuing being a Christian pop EDM singer songwriter. I thought I'd finally found God's calling for my life when I encountered the power of God six years ago. And when I did, my eyes opened up to how worthy Jesus is of my surrender. So I surrendered to God for the first time and I surrendered everything, my dreams, my will, everything. Nine months later, I went to a conference. A prophet was there from a faraway country. He's now my spiritual father. But this prophet prophesied to me, you are called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ, and you're called to reach the nations. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah. And he said many shocking miracles would happen through you. And, and then it was God's calling for me to also start Fivefold Church. And when I heard this prophecy, I was shocked because public speaking and preaching was my biggest fear and weakness. I had no desire ever to preach. And public speaking literally is the only thing that made me feel nervous. And I'd like go brain dead if I ever had to speak on the cuff in front of people. Even speaking in a Bible study in front of three or four people, I would get nervous. I would feel everyone's eyes on me. I would kind of go brain dead. That was me. Also, leading a group of people was my biggest weakness I considered as well. I would had, had uh, group projects in college and all the time, just three people, four people, and not one time would I step up and be the leader. I didn't know how to. I didn't see myself as a leader. I didn't have any what I thought was natural unction to what a leader should be. Then God spoke to me when he called me to do all these things. God spoke to me, a true leader is not those things that you think, um, the take charging instinct unction, the great communicating, public speaking. It's not those things. What, what is a true leader is one who has my heart. One who is an example of what looks like to be Christ-like. That's a true leader. And then God told me, I'll give you everything else. I'll give you words to speak. I'll give you ability to speak. I'll give you wisdom of how to lead group of people, lead church. I'll give you all that. But you just need this. This is what a real leader is. <laughs> Amen? So I received that calling uh, to be an apostle. I, I didn't know how it was going to look like. I had no clue how I was going to preach every week, let alone, or uh, even one time, let alone every week for my whole life. I had no clue how that was going to happen, but I knew it was God speaking. So I obeyed. I put the music aside. I started Fivefold Church nine months later, June of that year. And that, was, that will be five years this June. That will be five years this June. And um, we started on a mountaintop. Uh, there was just between zero to ten people that would come on the mountaintop. I would lead worship and preach. That was my first time preaching. It was hard. It was uncomfortable. But God gave me the grace. God gave me the words. God gave me the strength. But it was pure obedience. And then we went into a building that, uh, that fall. Then we had about 20 people that first year. Second year, we had 15 Third year, we had 10. Fourth year, we had five. Then 2020 hit. Then we could no longer rent our church building. So we went online for a little bit. It was Jean Tal and me in Vivian, Jean Tal's mom's house. Vivian's here, I think, right? I see. Yeah, there she is. In Vivian's house, we would go live streaming. Fred was watching online. Fred's sitting right next to her. Fr Fred came because he's a, a, a longtime friend of Vivian. Vivian brought him. Vivian also brought Jean Tal told her about the church that's how she came the next week and so that was it sometimes I would preach online and there was nobody even watching even during the 2020 time then God said take church outside I'm moving outside of the box so then we went outside and the first service was I think I believe it was July 31st of 2020 and I think that day Fred and Vivian were there right and I think you were the only ones that very first time. And then Stone came shortly after. But I remember that first time I'm wearing a Revival Is Now shirt. And it was just Chantal and I. And um, we start declaring. I start declaring, Revival Is Now! And like preaching as if the amphitheater's packed. But it was just these two right here. <laughs> I think we, 
we sang revivals now too. I'm sure we had written it by that time. So we were singing revivals now, that song we sang. And the amphitheater is completely empty. And man, it's been four years now of believing in this promise that revival is going to break out. That there's going to be many people here receiving miracles. And it's supposed to spread from LA to across the country and the whole world. And it's four and a half years later. And there's four of us outside in the park we had decreased from 20 the first year to four and god had spoke to me the way this revival is going to break out is by one minute videos that people are going to see this is how people are going to be reached so i started making these videos um and i i i made them like three four years ago i think this fall be four years and i didn't know how to edit i taught myself how to edit Posted them every single day on every social media platform. God said every social media platform. TikTok came out. I, was, I reluctantly started TikTok because I, I was like, man, I'm already having to post on, like, YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, sometimes Twitter. Um, and they're getting hardly any views. The views aren't growing. So I reluctantly, I only got a TikTok because God specifically says every social media platform. <laughs> so I got a TikTok that year in 2020. I put a video out, a, a, a montage of God moving in power, even though there was just a small group of us that first year. And I put that video out. Um, uh, I put that video out on December 30th. And a day and a half later, that video had one million views on my 30th birthday. Hallelujah. But what's even more incredible is that there was thousands of comments on that video of all these testimonies of miracles that people received while watching that video. And I'd, I'd only seen one person receive a miracle, it was Stone's friend that fall, receive one miracle while watching a live. That was it, and now thousands. So people started seeing these videos. Uh, two months later, we, we then had, we were having services in the park. We had grown to about 20 people. It was very exciting, <laughs> 20 something people. And that's because people were trickling in from seeing the videos. This girl came from Massachusetts, she flew here, and the same week, uh, a person flew from Nashville. She brought a friend. The girl from Massachusetts brought a friend, and I was shocked. I remember going to the park that day. I'll never forget it. It's like a flashback memory in my mind, pulling up there almost, driving and talking to God, being like, Lord, I cannot believe you're bringing people, multiple people from across the country just to come to church in the park, revival in the park of about 20 something people. I was so expectant. And uh, that girl that came from Massachusetts, from the East Coast, I started praying for her. As I started praying for her, demons started manifesting in her. She fell to the ground, she started convulsing, she started shaking. And I never seen demons convulse in my ministry before. We've never seen that at Fivefold Church before. But I commanded the demons to go. God gave me wisdom of what to do. He led me, and the demons left her. Praise God. Hallelujah. She was free. And, and that video went viral. Um, by the way, by the way, the very first demon that was cast out, which really, this was the beginning of what launched this, revi this revival movement. God used a woman who traveled all the way from Massachusetts, the East Coast. And I'm like, wow, that would have been amazing for someone to get on a plane from, like, Arizona or Colorado or something. But Massachusetts, God, whoa, all the way across the whole country. And the same week, someone from Nashville, that's almost the East Coast, too. That's so far. And um, I was just reminded last week how Malaysia, I looked it up. I think it's almost as far as you can travel, basically, from L.A., and Australia would be like the second most, basically, that area. And on the same day, you came from Malaysia and a woman came from Australia. So God now is repeating what he did before, but on a global scale. So we are about to see this revival multiplicate much, much, much higher, much more. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So the videos went viral of that girl being delivered. More people started coming. More people started coming. Uh, we grew to 70 people in two months. In May, the second to last week of May, there were 70 people who came. 
That's because that video went viral, and then God kept delivering people every week. He kept bringing people, delivering them. One girl that got delivered when there was just about 10 to 15 there in April, uh, that video now has like 20 million views uh, on TikTok. If you divide all the one-minute clips I put and put them all together, it's 20 million views, 10 million views, I believe, on Facebook and on YouTube. So many million views of this woman being delivered when there's just 15 people around in the park, or 20. And so then there were 70 people that came the second to last week in May. And then in one week, exactly a year ago from this Sunday, May 30th, 300 people came to revival in the park. From 70 to 300, in, that's my God. That's our God. That's a miracle only God can do. <laughs> when you're going backwards for four years, it looks like, 20 to 15 to 10 to 5 to 2, in one week he makes it 70 to 300. That's our God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. That's our miracle working God, our faithful God. This is why this day is so special. I will never forget this Sunday. It was May 30th. This week is so special. On that day, not only did 300 came, but so many miracles happened. People were delivered. Person after person was delivered. It was truly like the revival I had dreamt of. I had been longing for pretty much daily for four and a half years. It was there before our eyes. And that was just really, I mean, that was like God opened the floodgates for this revival from there. Because ever since that day, there have been hundreds who come here to revival in the park. Since that week, a year ago, since that week, people have flown Every week, there hasn't been a single week where someone hasn't taken a plane to come here and encounter Jesus. And now we have four continents in one week last Sunday. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And because people were seeing all the miracles happening, the revival breaking out there in, in beginning in March, then May, it increased so much. By July, all of a sudden, there was so much hunger that we found in the emails saying, please come do a revival in the park or a revival service in our church in this state, in this state, in this state. Then it became countries. So ever since last August, Chantal and I have traveled to different states and now f- six countries, I think this will be our sixth one, in just this sh- 2022, uh, t- to minister to people and see God deliver people and heal them and revival break out in different cities and countries across the world. And he's been so faithful in every service. I'm telling you, he's never let us down in in any service. Every service he has shown up. Every service it's been revival. Every service there have been so many delivered and healed and weeping as they encounter God's love. Every service. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. So this is such a special day that we remember. It's Memorial Day weekend, and we have a lot to remember to memorialize what God has done. This is, uh, on that day, I've never felt the, I've never had such revelation of God's faithfulness as I did that day. Never. From that day, I just wanted to scream on the top of the rooftops, God is faithful. He's faithful to his word. His promises really are yes and amen. Today, I want to teach you how to make it to the promised land. How to see the launching of your calling. How to see the promises actually fulfilled. That place. That place where the things are actually birthed. That you're believing in and waiting in and you're on a journey to get there. I want to teach you how I was able to make it, how we were able to make it at 5F. Not everyone makes it. Many of the Israelites didn't make it through the wilderness to the promised land. Many of them didn't make it. So we don't just automatically get there. There are keys 
of how to get there. There are spiritual keys of how to make it to the promised land. And I want to share those to you, how we're able to see it come to pass. Amen? So when I first received, when I first received the prophecy, you were called to be an apostle. You're called to reach the nations. God's going to do all these mighty miracles through you. You're called to carry this precious, mighty anointing power of God. When I received that prophecy, I, I, I really instantly was so humbled. I was so shocked. I was so like, God, what? You would choose me for this? I did not feel worthy of this. I didn't feel like I deserved it at all. I didn't feel like I was... Like, why did God choose me? I definitely felt that so much. But I knew God was calling me to this, and so I knew I just need to accept this, and I need to live my life in gratitude and humility and do the very best I can to serve God with excellence. That revelation hit me. I was very humbled when I received this promise. Whatever God promises you, it's big. And God is calling every single one of you to receive and walk in anointing. God is calling you to this. So when I'm, by the way, when I'm talking this message, it's it's like this message is speaking of when, when God first calls you, when God first begins to pour anointing in you, there's this process until that calling is really launched, until you are walking in the fullness or at least the beginning of the fullness of the anointing that God has called you to. There's a process in how to get there. So for me, that anointing first came upon me when I I first received impartation. I received impartation from my spiritual father. That first came then. Uh, It will be six years in this this September. So it first came upon me then. That anointing came in me as I accepted that calling, as I surrendered as I says, yes, God, I'll put my music aside and I'll serve you. And I'll say yes to being an apostle and starting a church and doing all this that you want me to do. I say yes. When I said yes, that anointing began to pour in me. So for you, when for many of you, maybe we don't all receive prophecies like this is your calling. Sometimes God may speak it in another way. Sometimes God can speak it in your heart very clear, and there will be confirmations, and there can be prophetic confirmations. It's different for all of us. But I can tell you right now that it is absolutely God's calling for you to walk in anointing. It is God's calling for you to be disciples in this revival. As a matter of fact, the very first disciples This is how God sees you. This is how I see you. And I've preached this message for about a year now. I actually remember preaching this exact thing on that day, saying that God has literally is calling you now to be the first disciples of Jesus. It like that, like that in this revival move, like how the first 12 disciples were specifically chosen by Jesus. That's how God is choosing you to be leaders in this revival. This is God's word for you. I know this with all of my heart. It's up to you if you say yes. Jesus had thousands of disciples at one point. When that revival movement started with Jesus, it exploded immediately. Immediately, he had thousands following him everywhere. They were his disciples. Then there was one time where he was preaching something, and he, he was preaching something that people didn't quite understand. And he was, saying, he was saying things like, you must eat my body and drink my blood. Now, of course, we know what Jesus is talking about. He's talking about communion. But this was spiritual meat he was teaching that these people didn't understand yet. They couldn't grasp it. The way you grasp the spiritual meat, the new thing that God is speaking, is by humbling yourself. I mean, these disciples, they had evidence of evidence after evidence of the fruit of Jesus, that he was truly the Messiah, that he was pure, that he was of, of a good heart and was truly God. They had all the evidence they needed. 
But he's speaking these words. They didn't humble themselves. They should have been like, I don't get this. I don't understand this, but I trust Jesus. I've seen the fruit in my life that I need to trust him. I humble myself because he's way more spiritually mature than I am. Obviously, he's the Messiah. There's a lot of spiritual things that I don't understand yet. I know that. So there's, I humble myself. Help me understand what you're speaking, Lord. What does this mean? Eat my body, drink my blood. That sounds really weird. It sounds like vampire stuff. But I humble myself. I know that you can't mean that because I know you. But that's not what happened to the majority of the disciples. What happens is, is he speaks this. And Jesus sees he's, that they are offended. And he says, what, does, do these words offend you? He stood strong and bold. He didn't take it back. He didn't say, oh, I didn't mean that. Please stay with me. No. Jesus says, did I offend you? I'm speaking truth. Can you humble yourself? And what happens is they are offended. They didn't humble themselves. And the Bible says that tons of his disciples left. And this story happens right after Jesus feeds the thousands with loaves and fishes. So that's showing us that Jesus truly had thousands of disciples. So he's preaching this, and we can gather from this that thousands actually left Jesus at this moment because the Bible says that after so many left him, he literally turns to the twelve. He turns to the twelve, and as he's saying this, we can see that these are what's left. And he says, will you leave me too? And they say, where can we go? You have, your, your words are the bread of life. We, we can't go anywhere else. Yes, yes. But many forget that that happened to Jesus. This revival movement broke out and thousands, most of his disciples left him. Many are called, few are chosen. They were all called, but they didn't humble themselves, so they couldn't be chosen. I preached that message a year ago, and, where, and there's many people who are not here now. But I, this, they were called. God's calling you to be a leader in this revival. So I'm speaking this to you now, and I pray that all of you will be here. We'll stand strong for Jesus. Well, humble yourself so you don't get deceived by the Pharisee religious spirits, lies in the, the, the devil plants. Yes. You are called truly to be leaders in this revival. Yes. This revival is going, this revival is already spreading across the world, but it is so small compared to what's to come. I fly by the SoFi Stadium all the time as I, I literally fly every single week since last August and many times I see it out my window if I'm sitting on the, the left side of the plane. And every time, and it seems like God always has me look out the window the same time we pass by. Sometimes I'm sleeping and I wake up and I think to myself, I wonder if I'm passing the stadium. Open it up and the stadium's right there. <laughs> it happened one time. I, I, it really happened. Every time I declare, I declare mass deliverance to happen in that stadium Thousands receiving freedom at one time. Thousands receiving miracles, encountering Jesus in power. It's packed, that stadium. I see it. And it's going to happen. It is going to happen. It is so small compared to what's to come. This is the end time revival. God's calling you right now to be leaders. This is your calling. You want to know? And you want to know what it is? This is your calling. Leaders in God's revival. That you can stand strong, just like the disciples, amidst the most intense persecution. He's calling you to be on the front line. Will you stand strong for Jesus? He's worth it. It's worth it. The reward is worth it. There's a reward. There is a great reward. So this is your calling, and of course, it's going to all look different. There could, there, there's going to be some here that are called to five-fold office ministry just like me. There's going to be some here who are called to be leaders in different capacities. You all are called to be leaders. And there's many of you who are called to just be in your workplace. You, you, you have passions for certain things like to be a teacher, to be a lawyer, to be a doctor, to be anything in the workplace. But you're called to carry anointing. You're called to serve in the work of God. You're called to evangelize and bring in the harvest in your workplaces. 
and set free and heal people in your workplaces as you speak to them. And come on church on Sundays and serve with all your heart and serve throughout the week however God's leading you. It's all going to look different, whatever your specific calling is. But I can tell you, you already know the biggest part of your calling. Maybe not the specifics, but you already know it right now. Your calling is to be a leader in this end time revival. And to carry anointing. To be an anointed vessel of God. That's priority. That's your calling. So what I'm going to share with you right now, like how I, how I reached the promised land, the calling, the launching of the calling, this is for all of you. My story will parallel all of your lives, like because it's the same calling, just looks a little different. Amen? Hallelujah. Praise God. So. When I first received that prophecy, and now, I mean, you, now you are receiving this prophecy right now, like in the same way. Like I received it through a prophet, but you are receiving it in a way through me right now. Or maybe, maybe I'm just confirming something that God's already spoken to you in your heart, that you're called to walk in anointing and be a revivalist. But when I received it, it humbled me so much. It humbled me so much. And this is a big key of what kept me strong through all those years is that I, I reminded myself that what God called me to is so precious, huge, I don't deserve this even. So whatever I have to go through, yes, Lord, with joy. You know, I don't, I, like what's happening now, it was prophesied. I knew it. I believed it. And I would see it. And I was like, me? Me? Your precious anointing, God? You're entrusting this to me? I, f- I was so humbled. So I valued that anointing that came in my life immediately. I did not see this manifestation like people... People would never look at me and say, you're anointed. Wow, you carry the power of God. People never said that until a year ago. But four years, four and a half years, I was, I was pastoring. And nobody in my life was saying, you're anointed. You carry the power of God. But I knew that I was anointed. I knew that anointing was inside. I wasn't seeing demons cast out until a year ago. I wasn't seeing big miracles happening. So I didn't really feel like it. Woo, I'm carrying power of God. But I reminded myself, I'm carrying this precious anointing inside of me. And it's growing every day as I obey God. This is precious. I would think of it almost like a baby, like what's inside of me is precious and I can't let it die. Because the because you you can do things to make it die. Like the Israelites, they're calling died in them you have to keep it alive I had to keep that anointing alive in me so how I kept it alive number one is valuing it and reminding myself constantly I am anointed I carry precious anointing in me and God is taking me through this preparation process for who knows how long But each day we're going closer. It's this precious anointing growing in me. And I don't want to do anything to harm it. I don't want to do anything that would make, like, some of it come out. I don't want to do anything to wander in the wilderness. And, like, God has his perfect plan. Like, he knew, like, he knew May 30th last year was going to happen. He had that all planned out. But what if I, like, was stagnant or went backwards and and disobeyed him God had his perfect plan and I knew that so I was like I want to make sure I stay in God's will I had the fear of the Lord I want to make sure I stay in God's will every day this is huge this is big I don't want to do anything to grieve God I don't want to ever disvalue this anointing in me and so I would go to church week after week and it was so discouraging to be truthful when there would just be a small, small group, and it would grow smaller and smaller each year. It would be so discouraging when I would see 
people come to church and then never come back again. It would be discouraging when I would pray for people and then they would, you'd see God touch them and they would tear up. That's how God would usually would move for the most part back then was not demons casting out, but prophetic ministry. I would just say a simple prayer and you'd see people just crying like just God speaking to them. But we would see that and then they would leave and meant most times they would never come back. So that was very discouraging, and I would long, like, why can't we grow? Why does it have to be so small still? I would feel that way inside. But I would remind myself. I would humble myself. The Bible says humble yourself. We have to actually do the action of humbling ourselves. So I would humble myself. God entrusted you, Catherine, with 10 people, like at the time, 10, to lead, to pastor, to be a shepherd, they're receiving their spiritual food from you. God's entrusted them to you. And I would remind myself, who am I to, to have that honor, to have that responsibility? The fear of the Lord would come upon me as I reminded myself of that truth. Don't take this lightly. Even 10 people that God has given me to, to lead is such a big responsibility and an honor. And God did not have to bring those people. Even the first year, the world would definitely say I was not qualified to be a pastor my first year. The, the first year, God brought a great group of people already. God did not have to do that. It's so important to not feel entitled. We are not entitled to walk in anointing. We are not entitled to be ministers, pastors. We are not entitled to have any of our dreams they're all gifts precious gifts from God we need to see it that way we have to remind ourselves we don't deserve this we don't deserve anything we don't deserve breath but it's just God's grace that he created us and gave us breath in our lungs and gave us every single blessing that he's given us and through all that time through those four years I was blessed, but I had to remind myself God was taking care of my finances supernaturally. I was healthy, and as I was walking in the anointing, I was experiencing more um, just health and energy and strength and peace and joy from the Lord than ever before in my life. So, yes, the promised land wasn't coming as quick as I wanted, but God had blessed me with all of these things, blessed me with Jean Tal to stand with me, and be this voice saying, I see the anointing in you. I believe. I believe in what God has prophesied. I believe that revival's now. I'm standing with you. And she even was like David and made covenants with me. Like, I will stand with you. She would see people leave me. She would see people betray me. She would see people telling lies about me um, and trying to get her to leave too. And she said to me firmly, I'm standing with you. I will not leave you. I believe what God has put in you. I believe in this revival. I will stand with you till the end. And not only that, but she would tell me how just coming for a couple months to the church, how her life was so transformed. How for the first time in her life, she was able to really surrender. And that anointing was just making things fall off in her life for the first time in her life. She'd never seen that happen before, even though she was a Christian before. But it's the first time she was really experiencing anointing. And, and she didn't have some, like visible deliverance kind of thing it was just being in the anointing made things fall off and she told that to me well you know what I cherished that testimony that was God speaking to me just like Mary you know Mary was was had this crazy supernatural experience with the angels you're called to carry the Messiah and so then the, the, then she's just living a normal pregnant life, and there's not really anything else supernatural happening. That one big experience happened. And then the baby's born, but then supernaturally there's shepherds that come saying, angels told us to come. And so she's getting this other precious confirmation from God of the promise that will take 30 years to come. The promise of seeing Jesus walk in the miracles. And then they went to the temple and there was these prophets, a prophet and a prophetess that said, oh, this is the Messiah. This is another beautiful uh, confirmation that God gave. There wasn't a lot, though. For 30 years, that's all she had. If you think about it, 
Mary was living a normal life, raising a normal kid. Jesus was just a normal kid. He wasn't doing miracles till he was 30. So she had to remember those powerful, amazing confirmations from God, signs that that word was true, that that encounter was true, that that prophecy was really going to come to pass. So that's what you have to do when God gives you confirmations, when God gives you signs, hold on to them, when he gives you fruit. So I held on to Jean-Tal. Jean-Tal was one of my only, like, huge, like, wow, anointing's in me, and God can use me in power. I don't feel like I'm a good enough pre- preacher. I don't see tons of miracles happening through me, so it doesn't feel like I'm anointed. But this is miracle, miraculous, what God's done in her. So I would remind myself of that again and again and again. I am anointed. It's in me. And if if God can do that for her, he can do it. He will do it for others someday. So that's the first thing is you need to humble yourself and value this anointing. You should come here with that revelation. Those of you that come here, those of you that come regularly, you should come with that revelation. I am anointed. I'm carrying anointing. As long as you come with a pure, humble, surrendered heart, every time you're here, you're receiving impartation of anointing that few people in the world have. Anointing is rare. So you should have that revelation. I'm carrying God's precious anointing. I'm like the original disciples. The original disciples, one day they started walking in miracles, but it didn't happen overnight. They were walking with Jesus and just watching Jesus do miracles. But they were receiving anointing every day they were with Jesus. So have that revelation. This is so precious what God's doing here. Come here with that revelation. I'm anointed. I'm receiving God's precious anointing. Hallelujah. That's how you keep the anointing alive. Number two, um, what I did to see the promise come to pass was to simply obey what God had asked of me. God asked me simple things, you know, start the church and do it with X and do it with all your heart. Lead with all your heart. Preach with all your heart. Serve, serve me. Serve the people. As, serve me as you're serving them. It doesn't matter if there's two people there. Preach as if there's millions Preach as if you're preaching to me, giving your all to me. Jesus would speak that to me. So I would just show up every Sunday, and I wouldn't want to do it. I would dread Sundays for years because I felt like I'm not a good preacher. So I never felt really confident, so I always felt uncomfortable. And every Saturday, I'd be like, Lord, what do I preach? I had that weakness. You know, God uses our weakness of, I don't know, I don't think, I don't feel like I get revelation from God. <laughs> and so every Saturday, what am I going to preach? It was the most uncomfortable feeling. So I would dread Sundays, but I would be spiritual. And I would s- remind myself, I have anointing. God's called me to release anointing to these people. Even though I'm not seeing tons of miracles break out, I believe that they're receiving life as I preach the word. This is what God's called me to, so I just have to believe it even though I don't feel it. So I would preach with all my heart, and I would put so much effort into preparing the messages and never do it like halfway just because there's only a couple people there. But I would give my all. And God also called me to edit videos, and I didn't know how to edit. But God says to Moses, like Moses is like, how am I going to do what you're calling me to do, all these miracles? But God says, what's in your hand? And there was a staff, a normal staff in Moses' hand. So God says, throw it on the ground. And as as he, as Moses does it, it turns into a snake. He was asking, how are people going to believe me that I'm sent from you? So this was God saying, you can show them this wonder. Do this with a staff. And the people, Pharaoh, they will believe that, and the, the, the Israelites that need to follow, they'll believe you through the wonders They'll believe that I sent you, that you're from me, that you're a servant of me, that you're a prophet of me through the wonders that you do through your staff, through your normal staff. So this is a very powerful principle. You have normal things in your life. You have a brain. You have ability to learn and teach yourself things. You have computer, which you can get an editing program on, for my example. (laughs) 
um, you have skills, you have abilities, you have resources, you have money, you have a credit card sometimes, you have, you have things that God's placed in your hands that look like not a big deal, that don't look miraculous or special. They look normal like every normal average Joe has these things, has a normal staff. But when God asks you to do something with these normal things, you do it in obedience, and when you do that, what specifically God's asking you, his supernatural power comes upon that normal thing you have in your hand that you're using, and he makes it miraculous. So other people, for example, can be editing, they can hire editors, they can they can uh, have teams of, of the, the viral people, like how do we make this go viral? They can pay to make it go viral, they can pay to have followers, all of that. And their video will not go viral, for example, because they don't have the anointing, because that God did not ask them to do that. But, for example, I was just a normal editor. Like, I, I was not a good editor. I taught myself. But God had asked me specifically to edit. And so because God asked me to do this, it didn't matter that I wasn't a great editor. It just mattered that I did what God asked me to do. I used that staff, that normal, not special staff and my Moses didn't have a flashy staff a bedazzled staff you know you don't have to have these bedazzled gifts and qualities normal staff and God makes it miraculous that's a principle in the spiritual realm I'm telling you whatever God's asking you to do you are different from people in the world when you're doing it it's miraculous the moment you start to do it and this is what God told me this is what God told me when when uh, he asked me to edit these videos, he said, you need to edit these videos, make put these videos out on all these social media platforms. This is how the revival is going to break out, is people are going to see these videos and come. This is how you came from Malaysia, right? <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> see? God is right. <laughs> his, his promises came to pass. And everyone here, I think probably everyone here has came from a video. Amen. <laughs> And if, if someone told you about it and you didn't see the video, it's because they saw a video. Every single person here, amen. So what God told me was you need to put these videos out and you need to keep doing them, keep doing them, keep doing them. You need to keep doing them just like how I commanded the Israelites to walk around the walls of Jericho until the wall came down. You need to keep going. That was God's word that he told me. And so it says here, Joshua 6, 2, um, Then the Lord said to Joshua, See, I have delivered Jericho into your hands along with its king and its fighting men. March around the city once with all the armed men. Do this for six days. Have seven priests carry trumpets of ram's horns in front of the ark. On the seventh day, march around the city seven times with the priests blowing the trumpets. When you hear them sound a long blast on the trumpets, I have the whole army give a loud shout. Then the wall of the city will collapse and the army will go up, everyone straight in. So they did that. They did what God asked them to do. They obeyed God. Joshua 6.20, when the trumpet sounded, the army shouted, and at the sound of the trumpet, when the men gave a shout, the wall collapsed. So everyone charged straight in and they took the city. So that's how they finally entered the promised land, was obeying this strange command from God that doesn't make sense in the natural mind what would have made sense was for them to like train like lift weights you know because there there's big giants in the land uh practice their shooting whatever the weapons they had i don't know training to be better soldiers would have made more common sense whereas walking around a wall and screaming and playing trumpets is foolishness and it, it, doing that is not going to, like, make brick by brick fall off, fall down. And they didn't see that. They didn't see any evidence that this silly thing they're doing is going to work. But it was simply God commanded them to do that. I edited videos for years, and the, the views did not increase at all. If I didn't have that word, I would have stopped after at least the first year. If I didn't have that word and I started asking people advice, they would have told me, that's not working. Try something else or you need to hire an editor or something. You're not very good or something. You know? But all I knew was God said that, so I'm going to just keep going around the walls. I'm going to keep editing and putting the videos out until that wall comes down. So I kept my eyes there. I, this is what kept me strong. 
I know we're going 10 to 15 to 10 to two, five to two people in the church, but I believe what God said will happen. I believe it. And so I know that if I keep obeying, I know it's my obedience. Right now I'm just going around the wall. So I just have to keep on focusing, going around the wall, going around the wall. Don't look at the fact that there's no brick by brick collapsing any proof that you're getting closer. Just keep Focus on doing what God says. It doesn't make sense, but it's just God said it. Just do it. Simple. It's very simple. And I and how I got here has been very simple with the things that I've had to do. Nope, it's been simple. Just God said to do this. Just do this. And then his supernatural hand's going to come after I obey. Enough. It's going to add up. Your obedience adds up. Like God literally does not miss a single ounce of your obedience. And it's it's, it's doing things in the spiritual realm. You're not just doing it just because it pleases God. And that's why we do it, by the way. Because it pleases God. And that's all we want. Amen? But, like, there's really an effect it's having. It's bringing you closer to the promised land. Every single time you obey. Every single time. There's nothing that goes to waste. And I also want to add that we should serve God with a pure heart. Which is what I just shared that... This is what I did when I was doing that. I wasn't so focused like, I'm doing this so the promised land can come. I'm doing this so my dream can come true. I'm doing this so people can, you know. I wasn't there. Every day, what motivated me was that it was pleasing God. Was that I was touching his heart. Obedience is God's love language. It's what touches his heart the most. So literally, like, that's what fueled me because we're, we're here to be in relationship with God, not to see our dreams come true or not to see God's dreams come true outside of relationship with God. Amen? So we can't be motivated just by this is how what, what the prophecy is going to come to pass. First and foremost, it needs to be this is what pleases God and this is why I'm doing it. Amen? Amen? And, 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 and God sees right through hearts. You can't have selfish ambition and make it to the promised land. You can't, you can't come and be like, okay, I, I'm going to come where the anointing is so I can receive anointing and I can be a great, powerful minister with selfish ambitions like that. It won't work. God sees right through your heart. You, you'll fall away. It won't happen. The anointing won't flow. The anointing is not guaranteed to flow just because you're here. You have to have that pure heart where you just want to please God. You just want God's will to be done. You have no selfish ambition at all. You're here to be a servant, a servant of God. That's what makes the anointing to come. So that's where I kept my focus through the whole time was I just want to please God. I just want to please God. I just want to please God. I had to, especially because that dream was God's dream. It wasn't even my dream. (laughs) <laughs> so I was like, I'm doing this just because I want to please God. And as I did that, his dream became my dream. When you obey, God transforms your heart supernaturally. Amen. Amen. Habakkuk 2, 2 verse 2, it says, Write down the revelation and make it plain on tablets so that a herald may run with it. For the revelation awaits an appointed time. It speaks of the end and will not prove false. Though it linger, wait for it. It will certainly come and will not delay. The vision will come. It will not delay. Though you feel like it's taken a while, it's right on time. You have to write down and take seriously the promise. I had like a vision board thing I made. I wrote down the prophecies. I wrote down the promises, specific words, specific prophecies. I put them on my wall. I would look at them almost every day. When I was feeling discouraged, I would intentionally go and look at them and speak them aloud and, and remind God of what he's promised, remind myself of what God promised me. This is what's happening. This is the truth. So this is a principle in the Bible. It's speaking right down the vision. This is This is how you're able to Stay in the truth and not get distracted and not forget. We're humans. We forget easily. You have to write it down. Put it in a place you can see it. Intentionally look at it. Speak it aloud. 
Um, also, because I never wanted this anointing to leave out of me, I never wanted to do anything to like hurt the anointing and keep me from reaching the promised land in the perfect timing. I knew the power of our tongues. And the Bible says, Proverbs 8, 21, the tongue can bring death or life. The tongue can bring death or life. The tongue can actually bring death upon your calling, death upon the anointing that's in you if you're using your tongue wrongly. And in the same way, your tongue can bring life. Your tongue can make that anointing to grow and help you to stay right on track and help you to, to stand strong against all of the schemes of the devil. So from, thank God, God had even prepared me with this revelation of the power of life and death is in your tongue. He gave me that revelation even before receiving this prophecy. In the, in the nine months when I had first surrendered to God, that's when I had this revelation. And I became like quiet when I first got that revelation. Like I used to be really talkative. I'm very, I was a very sociable person. And you know, you sometimes you just talk to talk and you just don't think about what you're saying. But all of a sudden I had this revelation and I became quiet in order so that I could be very intentional that I was only speaking life. And I, and I just wanted, even, w even with friends, I just wanted to add a purpose to their life. Uh, I, I didn't want to just talk just because it made me feel like connected or close to them or make me feel better or make me feel heard, you know? Like I wanted what I spoke to be something from God in their life. Not to be, like, super spiritual, like, yes, we can talk about, like, normal things, <laughs> you know, but in your conversation, that it comes with purpose. Why am I speaking this right now? Is it for my selfish reasons that I'm speaking this, or am I speaking this to bless somebody? Amen? So praise God I had that revelation. So when I received this anointing for the first time and that impartation and the, the prophecy, and I'm like, I'm anointed, I'm carrying this anointing. I became so careful with what I spoke. And I became very careful to, to only speak life over my future. So that means that even though the church was getting smaller and smaller and smaller, I would never utter the words, this isn't working. I don't know if this is actually going to happen. How could this happen? I never uttered those words, how could this happen? I was very careful with what I spoke when it came to the promise, when it came to the anointing. I wouldn't say, oh, I guess I'm not a good enough preacher. I never said those words. I felt it that way because of the lies of the devil, but I never said, I don't think I'm a good enough preacher. Uh, there must be, it must, I must be doing something wrong is the reason why we're not growing. I never said those words, not once. I never said after year four, I never said, I don't know if this is ever going to happen. I never said it. I made a commitment with God that I believed in his word. The moment I received that promise, I made a covenant. I made a promise to God that I would not doubt him, that I would not doubt his promise, and that I would only speak life and agree with his will over this promise. I made that commitment, and I made, I lived that commitment every day. You know, Chantal can probably testify to this. I'd be very careful with what I would say. I would say, people would leave. I would say, we're going higher. <laughs> yeah. You know, and when I would see these attacks, I would say, wow, the devil must be really afraid of the anointing in me. Yes, and even the, the videos that I would post, I would never even say, I guess I'm not a good enough editor. I don't think these are working. The views aren't growing, so this just is not working. I did not even ever utter that. Of course you feel that. Of course the devil's trying to tempt you with lies, trying to make you think it's your own thoughts and it's truth. But you have to remember what God's truth is and be so committed to only speak God's truth every day. This is what we learn from the Israelites' mistakes. This is what the Israelites didn't do, watering in the wilderness. Complaining. Forgetting the wonders that God did. 
I would remind myself of those moments, my spiritual father prophesying these things. I would remind myself, this is real. This is God. I would remind myself of the miracles of bringing Chantal, for example, and, and the miracles that God had done in her life. I reminded myself. And I would not complain. I did not complain. I would not complain. I would not complain to God. God, why can't you make it grow bigger? Sometimes with tears, I would be so much wanting to complain and just, just like whine, but I wouldn't. Through the tears, I would say, Lord, I trust you. I know you're refining my heart right now. I know it's a really big calling, and even 50 years is not enough time that I would be worthy to walk in this calling. So do exactly what you need to do, Lord. I trust you. You're in control. Do what you need to do to make my heart like yours. I would say that through tears when I wanted to complain and weep and be like, woe is me. I wouldn't talk about it to a lot of people, the bad things that would happen. I mean, the persecution and all these things. And I would speak to my mom maybe, but I would make sure I spoke with life. Yeah, so this person did this. This person did this. Yeah, so this is it now. But God is good. And I'm getting stronger through this, and we're going higher. <laughs> you know? <laughs> we have to be careful to not even have our one or two friends where we were like, okay, this is where I unleash, and woe is me, and can you believe they did this to me? You know, even one person, don't do it. Your, your words are still words, even if it's one person. Those are still words of death. That's why the Israelites didn't make it to the promised land is because they kept complaining. They forgot what God did. All those mighty miracles. Do you know, they, they split the sea. And they did so many wonders. And all of a sudden, they forgot everything. And they say, I think it's better that we go back and be slaves. Are you kidding me? <laughs> they said that, though. They complained about manna falling from the sky, that it was the same exact food every day. And that's what I could have done. There's still only 20. Now there's 15. Now there's 10. Now there's five. But God was bringing precious people. Look at Vivian and Fred and Chantal and then Stone. I'm so thankful to you all. Thank you. I thank you and I honor you for standing strong, for supporting this vision. They always supported in everything, in every way. They sewed, they were always there week after week. And Fred would bring all of the equipment. We used to set, now we're really simple, but we used to have all of this big stage and lights. And we would he would come to my apartment where half of my apartment was filled with e church equipment, with riser thingies, concoctions that we used to make a <laughs> temporary stage that we'd take. And, and all the instruments and drum set and speakers. And he would come hours early. We'd load my car. And we'd take about two hours at least setting everything up for about five people that would come. And then we'd tear everything down. Chantal was always part of that as well. Then we'd tear everything down for about two hours afterwards and load everything up in my car and take it all back. So, so many hours just trying to give our best to God <laughs> They were giving their best to God when there was just a couple there. So value, that, you know, I had, that was the manna. I wanted more for sure, but God, that was the same manna, for example, where it wasn't growing, but it was still miraculous. It was still miraculous that God would send these precious hearts that would believe in this. They came the first year when I had only started the church a few months prior, and I had no seminary degree or anything. And they're much older than me, but they saw me with spiritual eyes, with the heart of God. And they came and they supported fully. That was precious manna that I thanked God for. That God reminded me, be thankful for that. Amen? So the Israelites, they were complaining that it was just the same thing every day. Same bread. When this is miracle falling from the sky. So in your time of being prepared, for example, look for the miracles that God's doing and don't take it for granted. It's a, it's a miracle. Hallelujah. Praise God. So prophesy. Prophesy. I would declare this is going to happen. God said this. Keep speaking it. Anytime you have the urge to complain, 
Start thanking God and praising God. Renew your mind. This is what's happening in the spiritual realm. Uh Uh-uh, I'm not going to be like the Israelites and die in the wilderness. I am making it to the promised land. I thank you, Jesus. I know you're doing exactly what you need to do. The preparation you're doing is just perfect, so I don't complain. I thank you, Lord. You know what I need. Amen. So these, these, were all, these are some of the big keys I'm sharing with you today of how we got to see that, that day a year ago, that promised land. We got to enter it. And we're in it now. Amen. And it's about to grow more and more deeper into the promised land, past the giants we have to conquer along the way. Devil's very angry <laughs> when we've reached the promised land of revival. So there will, there will be obstacles but there's greater pastures ahead than we've never seen before. The harvest is now. The harvest is now. And the laborers are few. So come on and say yes to Jesus. Be a leader in this revival. Carry this anointing. Amen. Hallelujah.